all, in order to talk about football systems, we need to start talking about what a system, what a system is. The, the original root of the word system means placing something for some end. So it's not only a matter of saying 442, 433, 4, 4, 532. It's a matter of understanding that a system involves much more than only the positioning of the players. Systems mean space and functions. Where do the players need to be and what do they need to do? So it's, it's much more. If we go all the way to the history of the systems, then we find that, uh, and that's a very interesting book to read, Inverting the Pyramid, that the history of systems in football is a history of fear. Every time the price of losing is much greater than the price of winning. So the rewards are less and less and the fear of losing is more and more. So we've completely inverted the pyramid from going from the initial formations that were 1-1-8 to the formations that we have today that are 5-3-2, 5-4-1. The history of systems is the history of fear. What's the, one of the, the my system of preference is 4-2-3-1 and it's one of the much more, the most used in, in international football at the moment. Most, the greatest percentage of teams play in this system, 4-2-3-1. What does that mean? That we're now playing at, in four lines. It's not anymore uh, defenders, midfielders, and attackers. We've divided it now into four lines. That's why it's 4-2-3-1. And I know, Rafa, that you want me to talk about the, the goalkeeper, so it's 1-4-2-3-1. So in that sense, is that we play in four lines, and it's supposed to be a better distribution of the space of the pitch. We're dividing ourselves in four, four rows and four columns, to say it, uh, the ones that work in Excel, they will understand it better. It's four columns and four rows. I think in four, two, three, one, it gives you a greater flexibility. You still play with a playmaker and we play with wingers. And I really like wingers because in order to put, in order to sell tickets, you need wingers in your team. You need a team that plays with wingers because fans want to see those wingers. Fans go to the stadium to watch uh, Chucky Lozano, Jurgen Damm, Rodolfo Pizarro. They're not, they're not there to watching sitting midfielders or central defenders. People buy tickets to see wingers. So that's why we like to play in a 4-2-3-1 and it's one of my preferred systems. Why do you think that in the beginning, a long time ago, teams play with more offensive players and nowadays teams are very balanced between offensive players and defenders? I think the reason, as I stated in, uh, in my first question, is, is fear. Everyone that works at professional football is in fear of losing their jobs. So we need to put more defenders so not to lose. And every, every day, the importance of winning is less and the fear of losing is more. You need not to lose in order to keep your job. So that's the, reason, the main reason that I find for coaches that are now playing with more and more defenders. Being 1-4-2-3-1, you prefer formation. How do you adapt it during a game? The flexibility of the 4-2-3-1 system, and I think it's one of the greatest uh, strengths of this system, is that the triangle in the middle, if you constitute this triangle with flexible players, if the number six, which is the sitting midfielder, can play as a center mid, if the number eight, which is a box-to-box -box midfielder, can play as a number 10, and if the number 10, which is a playmaker, can play as a nine, then you have the, the chance to change into a 4-4-2, a 5-3-2, a 4-3-3, without making any substitutions. This flexible triangle in the middle allows you to make a lot of, of changes and, and, and make it flexible so that you can present uh, diverse challenges to your adversary. And it needs to be stated that I think that the game model or the 4-2-3-1 is not a, a set rule. It's not that you can't change it. For us in Pachuca, that's the game model. And the game model, we consider it something to come back to. We consider it home. You can change it to a 4-3-3 or into a 5-3-2, but then you go back to 4-2-3-1. You don't need to keep on inventing. It's something to come back to. It's like the melody in a song. You go different ways, you try different things, and then you go back to the melody. This is something that it's, uh, we call it home. It's something that we're really comfortable in. We know exactly how to play it. And if we need to change in order to, to face up certain difficulties that the, that the adversary is, is showing, we do it, but then we go back to the 4-2-3-1 system. What would you be the best advice in terms of formation learning for youngsters? With young kids, in Pachuca especially, well, in Mexico, in whole Mexico, we play 8v8 football all the way up to 11 years old. 
after 11, when they become 11, then we play 11. So we call it 11 at 11. So when they come, they become 11 years of age, we play 11 in the football pitch. Before that, we play eight. And we have to find a system that allows us to train that way. In our system, we play with one goalkeeper. That's one, three, one, three. Why do we play three, one, three? Because whenever they, they, they start playing at 11, in 11 football, then we want to play from the back with three at the back. The two central defenders that go all the way to the sides of the box and the number six that comes in, in, the, in the half moon outside of the box to try and take the ball out with three. Then we need a number eight and then we try to attack with wingers and a central attacker. That's why we do a 3-1-3 three, three. with the goalkeeper, it's eight. That allows us to build up into the system that we want to play afterwards, which is a 4-2-3-1 in which we put the, the, the two fullbacks all the way to the front. We, we push out the central defenders and the number six comes to play. So that makes it a 3-4-3 three, three, three formation in order to, to take the ball out of the, of the box. So we think that the best way to develop that with young kids is to play a 3-1-3 three, three right from the when they're uh, the first kids that we have are eight years old. So eight, nine, ten, they play 3-1-3. Three, at 11, they start playing the 4 3 one system. After 15 years as coach, does the coach have to adapt to the players in terms of a fixed formation, or is the other way around? In order to answer this question about what's best to adapt to the players you have or make the players adapt to your system, I think it's key to understand why were you brought into this team to do. If you're, if you're a coach that you were brought into Pachuca, then we ask you to play in a certain system and try to adapt the kids to the system because we know that in order to, for them to develop and get all the way to the top, to first division, they will need to, to understand and to do these kind of things that we're asking, we're asking them to do. If you're brought up into a school and they hire you into a school to try and win trophies for the parents, then you have to adapt to the players you have, right? So it all depends on why did they hire you to do, uh, what's the objective of the club you, you arrived to? As for the tactical topic, what are the pros and cons of your 1-4-2-3-1 formation when facing a 1-4-3-3 formation? I think in order to see how the, where there are the strengths and weaknesses of playing a 4-2-3-1 against a 4-3-3, I think it's highly adaptable. For us, the, the, the greatest difficulty is when they play four in a diamond shape and two in the front. That's the, uh, the, the hardest to play against. But 4-3-3 against a 4-2-3-1, it's quite easy because the triangle in the middle, you only have to push number eight a little bit on top and make six become central. And then you, you find that it's three against three in the middle. There's a little bit of, of difficulty. The 4-2-3-1, what it makes is there's a lot of space be, behind the wingers, in front of the fullbacks and behind the wingers. The distance between, because they're not midfielders, they're wingers, so they're high on the pitch. So the space be behind the wingers, that can become a problem when you're playing a 4-3-3. But I think it's highly adaptable. We do not suffer when playing against a 4-3-3. What would be your strategy to face a team with 1-4-4-2 formation, including a diamond in the middle? A 4-2-3-1 against a 4-diamond-2 shape, that's very difficult because it's very hard to cover two attackers with four defenders. It's very hard because you have a man-on-man a -man in the middle. So you eventually have to close down one of the, of the fullbacks so that you can have the numerical advantage. And in the center of the pitch, you have four against three because you have your six, your eight, and your 10 playing against, against, a four, against four of them. It's, it becomes very difficult for us and it has proven very challenging. You need to bring back number six to try and get their number 10, their playmaker. And you also have to close down a fullback and you end up making a line of five and changing positions. And once they make you change your system, I think they, they have the upper hand. That's the, that's the most difficult thing. We've tried different uh, solutions and, uh, and well, that's positioning, but uh, it, you have to also consider the, the particular skills of every player that is playing in that 11. What would you do when facing a team with a 1-3-4-2-1 formation with just three defenders and a very crowded midfield? Yeah, if you're trying to play the systems game and you're not considering a particular game model 
and you're only trying to find the weaknesses in the other system to try and develop your own squad, I think that if they play with a line of three in the back, the best way is to attack with wingers and a central defender because then you'll have three central defenders because most of the teams that play with a, with a back line of three, they play three central defenders. You'll make them go out and catch your wingers on, on, on open space. And a winger against a central defender in open space will always win. So whenever we find, and we're playing that game, if we're, if, if we're playing the system game and they play with a line of three in the back, then we play with three on up front trying to to force a hand-on-hand -hand, uh, situation in all the pitch. If they're playing with a line of back uh, uh, and a line of four, then we play with two central attackers and that creates havoc. That creates a lot of, of problems. If you're not very tactically aware, they will suffer. If your game plan includes three attackers, that is two wingers and one forward, what will be the reaction of your opponent? And what will happen if they were to play with a lot of players in the back? That's even better. If we play with three attackers and they pull their wingers back and they're defending with five against three, that means that they have an overload of two players. So that means that if they have an overload of two players in the defense, they're, they're losing two players in the midfield. So we have more people in the midfield. And that means that we can have control of the ball and possession. And we can make them play deep down. They will drop down. Now that we have the ball, what do we need to do? We need to move it quite quick. Possession needs to be really fast, really pinning the ball, pegging the ball, so that it comes and goes very fast. And you need to have two things. First, the first thing we've already got. With three players, we're holding five of them. So we have a numerical advantage in midfield. We're playing the ball quick. We have to be very aware of defense in attack, because if they score, then it's going to be harder. We have to move the ball fast, as I told you. And we need to have someone that hits it very well from the, from the midfield. If we have a mid-distance shooter, then we have to put it and to try it more and more. The three in the line, our three attackers against the line of five need to be really on line with their five because if they start dropping down for the ball, then you lose this numerical advantage in the midfield. They need to stay high up, high in the line with them so that a single control will make them face up the goalkeeper. And that way, if you can force those three situations, good defense in attack with three stopping five, quick movement of the ball, hard shooting, and them playing at the same level, I think you'll have high opportunities of winning the game. Under your one 4 2 3, one strategy, how will you distribute your players if planning to use two guys on top? Yes, we're, we're highly faithful to our game model, but that doesn't mean that your number 10 cannot play as a number nine. Actually, at Pachuca, our number 10 is more like a nine and a half, we call it. He has to be a good scorer. Our ideal type of player in there is Victor Guzman, a player that gives you eight, game, eight goals a, a year. Why? In Mexico, in order to go all the way to the playoffs, you need at least to score 28 goals. How are you going to score 28 goals? You need at least eight for the num from the number nine and at least six from your number 10. It cannot be one of these playmakers that only plays, does not score. He needs to go in the box and score goals. So in the end, it's very easy to make them play as two attackers. If we're not getting the ball all to, our, to our number nine, then we'll make number 10 play as a number nine. But we call this only contournal changes. You're not really changing your game model. You're just making minor changes or adjustments to try and exploit the weaknesses of the rival. In your view, how important are the stats? such as goals scored and goals conceded. In order to talk stats, you, can, you have to always interpret them. What we found is that it's highly correlatable the number of goals that you make and the number of points that you make. In order to make 28 points, that's what you need to be sure that you go into the playoffs, you need to score 28 goals. If you go deeper into stats, and now you can see Leon is a clear example of that, a goal gives you a point, but a, a, a how you call it, a, a, a clean sheet? Not allowing goals gives you 2.5 points. So what we go about is we try to make 28 goals and have a positive uh, difference. But we know it's much more, even though it's counterintuitive, because everybody wants to attack and everybody thinks that goals give you points, it's a lot better to get a clean sheet because it gives you 2.5 points per match. 
And in order to build your roster, and it's something that we didn't talk about, but we do it, is you consider the average of goals of the players that are going to play in your 11 and your starting 11. And you consider also the tendency, because it's not only average, but also tendency. You have a very close approximation on how many points you're going to make. What would you be your advice after a hard defeat, probably by five or six goals? Would you change your formation? Those kind of crazy scores, like the one of Barcelona or the one of Mexico against Chile or the one that uh, Brazil against Germany, I think those do not go around tactical issues. It goes beyond. It goes, it's like a shell shock. Something happens at the mental level that you're not there anymore. The difference between two professional clubs is never that big. It has to do with mentality. And in order to avoid that, I think that you, you need certain type of players, those kind of leaders that can avoid these things happening. It's very difficult to talk about tactical stuff with that. We had it uh, just a few years ago. We lost in our first game, the first game of the season, in which you go with all these illusions and you go with all, all these uh, illusions, really. We lost 5-0 against Monterrey in the first game. When something like that happens, I think the best way for a coach to go about it is not to overanalyze. Do not let it go to your heart. Do not let it go to your stomach. Just a few analysis on what can we do better and just turn the page and try to get over it as soon as possible. Do not overanalyze. Do not go onto your players and really talk them down or, or whatever. You have to, to, that's something that has to do with emotions, not with tactics. Those games are emotions, not tactics. In your opinion, should coaches stick to just one formation or should they be flexible in order to get the best of their team? Well, I think it all depends on what, uh, what type of team you're coaching. I think it's very difficult to play a system well and to play two systems well or three or four systems, it's even more difficult. So in the beginning, I would, uh, I would suggest to play one system really well and then go on how to flexibilize that, that, that system. But in the beginning, I think you have to play one. And it all depends on everything. In Leon, we used to play a different kind of system because when we were playing in second division, we knew we had the best players. So what we used to call it is just mirroring. Whatever system the, the, the opponent was playing, we played the same system to produce 1v1s in all, in all positions. And if you produce that, then the players of better quality will win. And that's, that's what we used to do. But it, it all depends on if, you're, if you have the upper hand, if you're the underdog, it, it all depends on all, on all those kind of things and, and what type of team you're, you're coaching in order to, to make that decision. In Pachuca, we want them to play 4-2-3-1 because that's what they will play when they, become in, when they come into first division. Let's imagine that during a game, your number six is sent off and you are out of substitutions. How would you react to this situation? In, in our system, if we lose a player, uh, and it's the number six, and, uh, and I have no extra substitutions. And let's say that we're, that the, that we're not chasing the result, that the, the, the current result is good for us. Then I, will, I would bring the number eight as a number six, and I will bring the number 10 as a number eight. And we would play four for one. If we have to chase the result, if, we have, if we're losing and we need to do something else, then I would just play number eight as a number six. I mean, the box-to-box the -box midfielder bringing him as a sitting midfielder and keep on playing the same thing with number 10, with 7, 11, and 9. Because we need to change the result. There is no point in defending. With your best experience as a sporting director, how would you handle your relationship with a coach, head coach, with a negative result? In my relationship with the, with the head coach, I try to be really clear because I'm not that kind of... Uh, of over-explosive guy that can shout and, 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 and scream. Even though I studied and I have my, my, my licenses in coaching, I have never been a coach. So I don't go about him very strongly on tactical issues. I see myself as a sports director that tries to build structures around the, the head coach. I bring the best head coach that's available in my point of view. And then I try to support him with as much structure as possible in order for him to hit the targets that we want. If we have some differences in, in what, I see, what I see reasonable in a team, I always say to myself and, and to the coach, my obligation is to challenge your thoughts, not your decisions. So I always challenge his thoughts. I always go about him 
talking to him about, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? I think this player is better. I think this, this system is better. I think these are the weaknesses or, or whatever. But I never challenge his decisions. Once he's made a decision, I go fully and support him at, at all times. Marco, how would you address a situation in which your top player does not show up? What would you recommend? Yeah, for that purpose of knowing how to develop talent right from the start, you need to be really aware what will be asked for, from him, what will he need to, to have in order to get all the way to the top. What you've just asked, it's, it's a very clear uh, and a very repetitive thing in, in, our, in our academy. You have this talented player that can dribble past five players and score a goal. That thing will not be possible in first division. He will not be able to do that. If you take, again, going to stats, if you get the stats of European football, Champions League football, Premier League football at the highest level, you'll see that 90% of the, of the possessions are one or two touches. You'll see that 90% of the first touch football will be accurate, will be well played. So what you need to build in these guys is to try and build right the ability to play one, two touch football. Yes, they need to dribble if they're wingers, but if not, they have to learn how to play quickly because when they get all the way to under 20s and first division football, they will not be able to do what they did when they were 15. So they need to know that and they need to get used to this. Playing one, two touch football, understanding what we were talking about, cognitive, perceptual expertise, understanding where the space is, understanding, smelling the weaknesses of the rival, know their strengths. You have to teach them to do this because right now they're winning because of their own personal skill. But in my, in my uh, experience, uh, they will not be able to do that when they come to first division. Unless you're talking about a Messi or those outliers. And if you find an outlier, well, they're, they're, you're very lucky and just put your money in the bank. But, uh, but if not, you have to teach them all the skills that they will need to get all the way to the top. And that means first, uh, first, uh, first and two touches. What's your method to provide feet? back to players. What would you say to them in specific situations, such as ball passing, dribble, or not than losing the ball? Yes, yes. In order to, to assess feedback and how to, how to provide feedback age-related, specific to an age, I will always prefer questioning as a method of feedback because that makes them process the information. If he's constantly making a... First, you have to recognize a pattern. He's constantly uh, uh, making the same mistake. So you have to ask him questions about that mistake. Were you able to see the space? Why did you play this ball? Why did you think that was the best? Is there a better option? By asking questions, you make him process the information. Most of us who were former players, were too inclined to provide prescriptive information in telling him what to do at every single time. I think it's a lot better to provide uh, feedback as, a que as questioning. Regarding the age-related, in the beginning we talk, we provide a lot of technical feedback. When they're at 12 years old and, and further, we, we provide more organizational feedback about their relation with other players. And once they're 17 and up, we provide a lot of feedback related to the, to the opposition. Where's the strength? Where's the weaknesses? Where's the space? Where's, where's everything? There? So we start by providing technical feedback, then collective feedback, and then opposition feedback. That's, that's the way we process the feedback age-related. We always try to keep it friendly, friendly feedback, not attacking, not aggressive, and also uh, use questions as much as possible. When you're dealing with the really young players, what would you suggest to a coach that believes that a forward can also be a defender and vice versa? Yeah, I, I not only find it feasible, I think it is highly useful. We try to play almost all our players in two positions. We do not change the game model, but we do change the positions of the players within a model several times so that they can find uh, new roles, new perspectives, what the, other, what the other players really need from you and what you need from them. So we find it very useful to, to play them at least in two positions. And another rule is that most of the players, if you talk to any player in first division, even though they can be fullbacks or central defenders, if you ask them, where, the, where did they start playing? Most of them will tell you that they started as attackers because when they're young, the best players are always attackers. So we try in younger age to scout mainly for attackers, mainly for offensive players, even though when they come and we see their skills and we see their, their different characteristics, most of, many of the times they end up playing in the back. But if you ask to any central defender, any 
Un unless he's a goalkeeper, that's a separate story. But defenders and fullbacks and, and seating midfielders, they almost always started their careers as forwards. How would you address a situation in which a scout brings a player to the first team, but the coach does not like him? In Pachuca, we have the rule that managers and coaches can only talk about the characteristics of the player they want. They cannot talk about names because then you have the, 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 the problem that the, the, the coach has the, has the same agent as a player and, and he's only pushing players from a certain agent. So you cannot allow to, that to happen. So he's only allowed to talk about the characteristics of the player he needs. If he, if he needs a fast player that can go 1v1, that is a good crosser of the ball and, and can come and defend, then you have to find through your scouting department a player that has all these characteristics. If he still, you give him three or four that are still, that, that are viable because you have the money to buy them. I'm, I'm not going to put Messi in there. But if you find three or four players with those characteristics and we can hire them and he doesn't want them, then he has to have very, really clear arguments on why he doesn't want them. Is it personal uh, skills? Is it, uh, is it that that he doesn't really like the character of the player, he has to provide an explanation, a very full explanation. Because I'm giving him a full explanation of why I want him, I expect the same kind of response. And I have to say that once you put them into that kind of framework, it's very rarely that they oppose a signing. Can you give us three tips for a coach? In order for a coach to excel at our club, he needs to have, first of all, a high interest on the kids, on the well-being of the kids, on the developing of the kids, much more than developing of the footballer and much more than developing of a football team or winning. What we need to have is coaches that are highly interested in the well-being of the kids. So that's a first and that's a non-negotiable clause. They need to be like that. And then try to think about them, try to think, not how you teach, but how they learn. In my experience and in the going of years, you have different kinds of players and it's not about how you teach, it's about how they learn. And you have to go in different ways, in talking different ways, in providing different feedback, in creating different training sessions, in getting close to him or away from him, in creating goals or just going, going very emotional on him. You have to be very aware. You have to really have an interest in the kid, get into his life. Try and listen to him, look at him, observe him, talk less and, and, uh, and uh, see more and hear more. Those are, are things that when I find it in a coach, I know he's going to be very good at our club. Marco, being an experienced sport director, what are the skills you look for in a coach? Okay, that's, that's something that we state very clearly when they arrive to the club. We need three things from them to improve the player to create a good atmosphere around the club and to win games. Those are the three things that we need at the club. And that's how we measure it. In order for them to have that, they have to be, have good reading and tactical awareness of the game. They need to have a good methodology and they need to be very good at managing the dressing room. Those are the three things that we need, ask from them. And those are the three things that how we measure them. Well, that's me. Thanks a lot for watching. And in any case that you're interested in any of the other topics that were covered, I'll provide further reading. Thanks a lot.